Well, good morning, everyone. And I am so excited to actually be doing my first stories podcast on a Saturday for 2023. And of course, I have an amazing guest on. And just to let everyone know, I am also simulcasting through the Wisdom Audio app. So welcome to my listeners on the Wisdom Audio app. You know, music has been such an essential part of everyone's lives. And with today's guest, he really represents, he's he's it, like he is the package. And I don't know how to explain it. You know, when you say to someone, um, you have it, although you can't really define it, he has it. And by the way, my name is Janice, the host of Stories That Inspire Us. Today, I am so excited to welcome Phantom Electric Ghost, whose AKA's alter ego is Josephine Electric. Yeah. But he is, <laughs> his name is Keith Gittin, Gittins Jones. So, Keith, welcome to the Stories Podcast. Well, thank you for uh, joining me. I'll, I'll introduce uh, Josephine. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Josephine Electric, and uh, I'm the lead singer of Phantom Electric Ghost. And I've been the lead singer uh, at the first, the, the beginning of the band. And then we uh, kind of segged into bringing my voice back or um, actually having Phantom's voice back. And, you know, Phantom's kind of crazy, but, um, yeah, we like to play with the technology. We're kind of a tech guy. So uh, we like using uh, synthesizer technology uh, to create what we call expansive sound. It's something we've been doing for a while, but we'll get into more of that of how I'm able to do these things in real time. But that is amazing. So, Keith, I also want to back up just a little bit with with your story. Um, you are a stage three cancer survivor, and <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> you know, when we had our pre podcast chat, and you know, obviously we've chatted on you know through wisdom. What I think really impressed me about your story was not accepting that status quo. It didn't define you. In fact, I think in some ways it probably fueled you to move forward with your music. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I've, I've been um, just playing uh, music uh, uh, as a keyboardist. You know, I was in band when I was like 15. Uh, with my brother and some guys from high school, we created a band we called NXT. And, uh, you know, I kept on going. A lot of other people stopped. But, you know, I got, I got uh, you know, back, I don't know, it's like when I was 27 years old, I got a level three sarcoma. And I've been working in IT and uh, I, I went through radiation and uh, three surgeries and I survived. And when I survived, I like, you know, I'm going to really take my music seriously. I started going to poetry readings. I started to um, push it out on SoundCloud. And, uh, you know, I eventually got married and I went to Japan. I did all this stuff. But I was able to, you know, push forward and really not be afraid. I wasn't afraid to go to Japan in 2006, you know, 2004, 2006 with my family. And I, I got kind of fearless and started doing podcasting, all this other stuff. It really drove me to stop just being a, a musician and actually become a singer songwriter. And see, that's what, to me, what is so inspiring because what I picked up from what you said there is you weren't afraid to, but honestly, Keith, the we the way that you said it was the backdrop to maybe if I hadn't gone through this experience, I yeah. may have never done that. Yeah, I think I would just have remained um, uh, uh, somebody behind the scenes, like a, a guy in a band that just played keyboard and there's always a lead singer and, and not going into production. I started getting into production because I had something to say. Even with my early bands, I was writing, but I wasn't singing. I, behind the scenes, I was writing like all the parts. And so I was doing like production work and I was figuring out how to arrange things. And a lot of bands had me do that, but I never took the lead because I was like, I was, I was satisfied to kind of be behind the scenes or structuring a song and let the lead singer and the lead guitar player take all the, all the, all the glory. 
And I was like, fine, you know, because I'm kind of arranging things. And I, I was fine with me until I discovered, like, we're not really going to get anywhere if you don't, nobody knows that you're doing that. <laughs> True, but wouldn't you, would it be a fair assessment to say, though, that being behind the scenes, again, led you to like, hey, I'm not stopping here. Nobody's going to know what, what I'm doing or how I do it to really, as you mentioned before, um, to seriously pursue pursue your music career. Yeah, it really pushed me into saying, not being afraid to, you know, start singing. In 2016, I started singing. And really uh, what, what happened is I bought this device, which, you know, you hear right now, the, 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 it's called the Roland VT3 or VT4. And it can pitch up or pitch down and it does all this weird stuff. And I was, uh, I played with it and I said, you know what, that device gave me the confidence to actually do something because initially I came out with just, uh, you know, Josephine electric voice. I, this was her voice. And I said, wow, I can do this in real time. I was able to do this voice and play shows in New York and it comes out through the mic in real time. And when I found out I could do that, I, I said, well, you know what? I, I, and it kind of came out with a, a, a cover. I had a, had a stagecraft. I had a mask. I had a mask and a hoodie, an electric hoodie that was all LED and a phantom mask. And so when that female voice came out, you didn't see me. You saw this mask. And then I felt initially confident coming out that way because I, I, you couldn't tell if I was a guy or a girl, a woman or a man. And a, a ghost, the way I thought about it is like a ghost could be male or female. So I could have these female songs and nobody, I, I don't have to dress up in a dress or something. I can just do it and use this machine that can shift And some songs would be male, some would be female, and I could just do it dynamically. And I went to New York and Boston and people dug it. Other producers started talking to me and say, how are you doing that? And um, it kind of launched my career in podcasting and music at the same time. <laughs> so. Wow. So when you go to these different venues, and obviously, when you registered on, on my podcast website, um, that picture of you, I was like, what is hmm, that? <laughs> it's very mysterious. Like, you, you just wanted to know more. And what I find very interesting about your music is that um, sound paintings. Yeah, that's been the idea. Wow. It, it, it kind of goes back to my... Um, the bands I like uh, are are kind of all over the map, you know, from like the Velvet Underground to Yes to, you know, Sun Ra or Miles Davis. I'm, you know, I'll listen to Johnny Cash. I'll listen to like Earl Sweatshirt or Tyler, the Creator. I'm kind of all over the map. But the biggest thing has been experimentation and progressive music, you know, you know, advanced fusion jazz bands um, have always kind of dri driven me. Uh, to, I think I've talked about it before that I saw this documentary with um, uh, George Martin and he was talking about the Beatles and he said, I, I could have recorded them just like they were in Berlin and they could have stayed like in a help mode like their whole career. They could have just done that, but they, they wanted to do more. And he had been working on these Peter Sellers comedy records and uh, they had all these overdubs and they had orchestras, they had backward tape loops and the, and the lads, like the four... The, the Beatles, they liked those Peter Sellers records and they knew George Martin had done that. And George Martin was talking in perspective like Monet, like, okay, like, why can't we do music like Monet? Why can't we be impressionistic? Why can't we use the studio to represent more than what we could do live? And uh, he kind of started it. You know, the other people might have started it before him, but with a rock band, he's kind of like the first one to, to take the idea that you can create a Sgt. Peppers or a Rubber Soul or an Abbey Road. And it's not what you would do usually live. It has stuff in it that you wouldn't be able to do live. That's the uh -huh. idea of a sound painting, you know. <laughs> well, you not only represent what you do in such a very unique way, the history behind it is also obviously very important to you. Yeah. I'm a music historian in some ways, you know, I've been a fan. I love music, you know, like every genre. That's why I called my music kind of expansive sound because people try to pin me down and say, oh, you're, you're an EDM artist. And no, I'm not. 
because one day I'll channel like like Coltrane or Sun Ra, and the next day I'll be channeling Johnny Cash or or like Radiohead. It mm-hmm. kind of wherever I feel like is like is I'm a musician and I like all genres and which kind of whatever I feel like that day I'm gonna do. And and in the industry doesn't like that initially. Initially, they they want to pin you oh your techno, your EDM, your house, your this. And I've never been into that. I've been like, what if, why don't I just, can't I just do what I want to do? <laughs> right. Yeah. And you did exactly that. Yeah, that's, that's been the thing. I mean, it, it kind of, it hurts you in some ways because you can't get some traction in some places are strictly EDM or strictly this. And so, you know, some people won't want to deal with you, but I've been able to kind of, kind of, kind of move around the corners and get through. (laughs) Wow. I have a question for you because I am a music, um, a musically challenged. (laughs) So you mentioned EDM. Yeah. Those of us who are musically challenged in some respects, what does EDM mean? Electronic dance music. And it's kind of taken over like hip hop. And I think I sent you a photo yesterday of what a, a, a synthesizer person's uh, opinion about it is because a lot of problems, problems I have with this is like, it's kind of like the idea of sampling, right? The problem I have with some EDM producers is uh, they're getting in front of like 300,000, 400,000 people and they're not really playing any instrument. They're, and a lot of them are sampling other people's music and then they're putting it together like an MC used to do back in the sick in in the, back in the uh, in the disco era, you'd have people who were MC, right? They're DJs, and they would DJ a wedding or DJ a show. These DJs are more like producers, and they know how to pit, fit things together, but they don't necessarily write. A lot of times, they don't write any of that stuff. That stuff comes from other people, and they're being presented like they're musicians. Uh-huh. And and a musician can kind of take offense to him. Now, there's some of them like Dead Mouse who actually writes his stuff. There's some of them that actually do write their stuff. But a lot of them are taking stuff from other people. And and it seems like the fans don't understand that that's not really a musician. That's not like watching Funkadelic or Earth, Wind & Fire or the Allman Brothers. It's not the same. And then they're taking up the spaces that those original type of musicians would have. So musicians are kind of getting a little upset. They're like, how come these type of people are getting the front instead of actual people who can play? <laughs> you know, Keith, to me, that sounds almost like plagiarism. Yeah, it's somewhat like that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I have a question for Josephine. Oh, you do? <laughs> yes. What, what would you like to ask me? <laughs> Josephine, what is your favorite song to sing? Like, what is the first thing that pops up in your mind? Uh, well, the, my favorite song is probably Ascending into Darling Mode is a song we put out is the title track that we did a couple of years ago. It was uh, this idea of um, love is not um, falling. Like everybody talks about falling in love. So we created an album called Ascending into Darling Mode. And uh, basically the idea is instead of falling in love, you ascend into love. And it's not um, something that's uh, going to be uh, a negative thing. Because the thing about falling in love is like, well, you, you feel like you're already getting hurt. In, in the initial statement of like, oh, I'm falling in love. Why are you falling? Why don't you like ascend? Like why it seems like it's somewhat codependent from the start. And so we we came up with this idea because we're like a poet. You know, we've been, poetry has been, lyric writing is a big part of what we like to do. And we like to take an idea and flesh it out, not just have a groove or a beat, but actually tell, say something. Oh, okay. So Josephine, I have another quick question for you. Uh, what is it that you love about working with the Phantom Electric Ghost? And keep, well, it, keep it nice. Well, I, I just had the freedom to kind of be, uh, you know, very open, you know, and, and a lot of the songs I sing, uh, are very kind of sensuous or have sexual connotations or I don't feel restricted in what I talk about. And uh, it kind of goes from like a Frank Zappa parliament, uh, you know, type of mindset or even a Prince mindset from like Dirty Mind. And, you know, it's not trying to be like what some rappers do today, just totally offensive. 
but it's just the idea that there's nothing wrong with sex. And if I want to get into that, I can go that way. And I'm not trying to just, uh, you know, be outrageous. I just, I'm trying to be authentic. Ah, gotcha. Now, do you think, who's the better headliner, Josephine or the Phantom? Well, at the beginning of the Phantom Electric Ghost, it's like I'm singing 99% of everything. The first uh, six, seven albums are from 2016 onward are, are primarily me as, as the lead singer because the uh, Phantom was being a producer and he, he didn't really want to step up. And his voice was so kind of menacing that, you know, it just felt like too much. And uh, one thing we found is like, you know, if you think about uh, music and uh, a lot of times the fall settle. You know, even with male male bands, um, falsetto has been like you think about the Temptations, thing about the stylistics, you think about Smokey Robinson, even a, in a rock bands like Robert Plant and Axl Rose, they're doing kind of pitched up female kind of voices. That that even in rock music, you hear that with Rush, you hear that with a lot of rock bands. It's like why is that? Because the female voice tends to our falsettos kind of can cut through the mix. They can get more headroom from a production kind of standpoint. And if we go with the deeper voice, not that we can't do it. And we've done, in the last three years, we've done more um, uh, Phantom songs. In the last two albums, have been a lot more Phantom songs than Josephine songs, but it's just something we've learned how to do better. It just is harder to do the, the mid-range and lower range. Uh, it's easier to, for us, at least as a producer, we like using the female voice more. Oh, okay. So you're the headliner. Yeah, I think most of the early albums, yes. I would say on Peg Forever, no. I only have one song on Peg Forever. And uh, the next album, Trash Wave, I have uh, more songs. But it's like a 50-50 split, where before I was like 90% of doing most of the early Ghost albums from like uh, Something Wicked. Uh, Indigo Menace, uh, Synesthesia, Neo, So Surrender. Um, uh, there's a bunch of albums we did uh, to, to Infinitum with All Control K. That was all, that was a collaboration with an art, another artist named All Control K. It's, you know, and then another collaboration with uh, Lonnie Clare called The Opposite of Space. They, they're all me. Um, but your fandom starts coming into play really on uh, Peg Forever, which just came out in November. I mean, August, and then we uh, have uh, uh, Trash Wave, which is coming out February 10th. Wow. So a lot of different projects going on all at once. So, Josephine, thank you. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much. Can we chat with the Phantom for a moment? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, Phantom Electric Ghost is, a, is kind of a, a Bob George idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, We've been a big a producer, uh, you know, for a long time. Um, back in 2016, uh, we started as the Ghost, and and it really the Ghost was uh, this idea that we could just use electronic uh, means to uh, get across our point. And then sometimes we're not as heavy as that. We get more, you know, real. Uh, but. Yeah, it's basically the, the male voice uh, becomes uh, either really pitched down and menacing or, be, you know, it's very, more like this. And so sometimes I would, I would go down like that. <laughs> but, you know, I like it's kind of a middle ground. We've been figuring out how to use this voice. And a lot of the newer songs are kind of in this tone with my kind of speaking voice. Um, but there's a lot of songs that are, that are pitched down. But. It just has had some effect because I already have a low voice. So if I pitch it down more, it gets more Isaac Hayes like. <laughs> oh my gosh. What would you say is the favorite thing that you love about your music? Uh I really I'm I'm a big fan of analog synthesizers. So I am a big uh, uh user of uh Moog, right? Dr. Robert Moog. Uh he's a famous uh inventor invented like one of the first synthesizers and the first synthesizer is like it's really back in the 1950s it's like 1958 dr robert moog in new york built the first moog it looks like a big computer it's just a gigantic modular menacing thing right and uh, bands like sun Ra, 
one of the first bands to actually use one. It was a jazz band who was doing like uh, bebop. They actually got one of the first ones. And then you got Keith Emerson from Emerson Lake and Palmer. He got one. You know, Pink Floyd, they got them. And uh, so these artists started, like, and a bunch of experimental artists in New York were just experimental musicians and they wanted to see what they could push the point. And the thing about these machines is they, they create sounds from the sound wave. So like from a square wave, a triangle wave, a pulse wave, a sine wave, you can build your own tones and they can approximate like what real music is. And there's an, a theory that Dr. Robert Moe came up with when he built his synthesizer called subtractive synthesis. And so it takes the sound wave, like a square wave, and it subtracts elements or harmonics from it and then creates something that approximates like a bass or a piano, or a sax, or something you never heard. Like in science fiction movies, when you hear that ooh, weird sounds, like those are early synthesizers. Those are early modes actually being used in science fiction movies and stuff to create those, those sounds. But then people have said, well, you can do more than just make these weird science fiction sounds. They can make special effects. Like R2-D2 is a synthesizer. That sound comes from a synthesizer called an ARP 2500. And it creates modulation that actually made that voice. Wow. You've really taken this industry by storm, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I think it's just phenomenal. When you go to a show, what is one thing that you would want your listeners or even the viewers to know about you? personally about your persona well the idea of the ghost is that it's basically uh i i was in bands for many years and then i got tired of people not showing up so i said we know can i actually do a one pant band band like you ever seen the kind of typical one man bands the guy wearing a banjo he's got the drum on he's got a harmonica he's got all these things he's doing everything himself mm -hmm. i said well i want to do that so well, how can you do that so i saw so I, I spent a bunch of years uh, just figuring out how can I actually do a show all by myself and not be a DJ. And so I I went and got all these hardware synthesizers and and I, I, I clocked them together so I could clock them. I've got foot pedals. I've got all kinds of controllers. And there's stuff that I wrote that I pre-wrote, but there's a thing, there's machines called, in a, or these type of synthesizers have these devices called sequencers. Now, sequencers basically can take a sequence you wrote and then play it in a loop. But the cool thing about analog hardware synthesizers is they can be triggered by something I'm playing, right? So they will actually play with me. And so if I'm playing, like, decide to play the piano line, and then I've got a bass line going through a sequencer, I can run a pedal. They can say, take that pedal, take that bass line and run it backwards. Take that bass line and run it random. So basically, a lot of my stuff will sound like it's real people, and it's not just like on the loop. It's actually something that I can manipulate in real time, even though it's looping. I can make it go backwards. I can make it go forwards. I can make it go random. I can tie it to my rhythms. So I've got all these controls, and I'm a musician. So over years, I figured out theory. I know how to do things. So I'll have things running in polyrhythms, running in like alternative type of tunings. And it's basically because I'm a producer kind of showing people my show is like a, a live production studio in action. That's kind of what I do. You know, the live production studio in action. And I really pictured that because when you were first describing that, you know, you were saying you were giving, um, you know, talking about the one man band, you know, many years ago with the, um, you know, the drum, you know, harmonica and everything that they're wearing, but really your show or your setup, I think it would be much more condensed, obviously, right? Yeah, it's kind of layered in a way. I mean, if you look at the old school, like synthesizer guys that I'm I'm a big fan of, like Keith Emerson would go on stage with Emerson Lake and Palmer with this big stack of these synthesizers. If people ever see the videos, he had massive like stacks of synthesizers all around him. And you go watch Genesis and you'd see like Tony Banks, he's got all these synthesizers around. 
Now, I only have so much money, but I do have a big collection of synthesized when I go on road. People are surprised because they think, oh, you're going to show up like a DJ. They just show up with a CDJ and an SD card and a laptop. I actually have to have roadies and a van and road cases, and I'm pulling out Moogs and Rollins and Profits and, you know, Hammond B3s. It's like, so I actually have kind of an old school setup, not unfamiliar to if you had ever seen Sticks or Roland, uh, 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 any of the old, like uh, Duran Duran, like Nick Rhodes. It's like, that's the kind of setup or a new order or a Depeche Mode. Those are the people that I grew up like, yeah, I want to do that. That's what I've always tried to be in, in that zone. But I've been able to do it without the rest of the band. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. What What is maybe one piece of equipment? And, and obviously, I know nothing about um, the synthesizers and all that kind of stuff. But what would you say is one piece of equipment that maybe you don't have? I don't have. Well, I, I've been um, really wanting a um, what they have to what they have is like when you're a production person, uh, they have these devices try to kind of post um, post audio uh, transformers. Uh, and there's a famous company there was uh, called Neve, and there's another one called um, uh, I can't a solid state uh, audio. And they make these processors that you know, when the recording engineers use. Now I've got some stuff like that, but I don't. You know, some of these Neve boards and stuff cost like thirty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars. You only oh see God. them in like studios. They're basically um, preamps and they're audio processors that can take your mix after you write it. You can take something and then run it through a tape um, emulator. And what's that do? It's like, so you say you did something digital. It's all on digital sense, but you want it to sound like it's analog. You can run it through this thing called a tape emulator. It basically makes it feel like it was done on a reel to reel. It actually takes that sound and runs it through. It actually sounds like it was done on a reel, which actually gives it analog behavior where it makes it sound fatter and more open. Uh, these, this is starting getting into the technical aspects of sound production where you can take sounds you did and reprocess them through all kinds of devices that are digital or analog and, you know, take your voice and, and ramp it up and make it sound like radio quality or take, take your snare drum and make it snappier or make it flatter. That's when you start getting into production, you take the things you wrote and you start to emphasize and really an engineer goes into a song that's four minutes long and let's say, a couple of seconds into it, they want the snare to be really snappy, so they change the aspect of it so it's snappy. And then they want to bring it down, make it flat. Or they want to make your voice doubled in one section or not in another. It's, it's basically embellishing what you did. And that's the next layer of, of production, and those machines are very expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have some of them, but I want more. <laughs> of course, as well as you should. The other day you sent me, um, I think it was about a three minute clip or so. Yeah. Is there a possibility that we could play that? Yeah, you can play anything I sent you. Um, I unfortunately can't play it on my end. Is it possible for you to play it on your end? Yeah, I've got different clips. I actually have one that's up, but it's like an audio clip. Um, is it okay if I play you an example of my songs? Absolutely. Yeah, so I've got a song that I have clipped up, and this is actually a Josephine song. Oh. It's, it's focused on, it's called Expansive Sound Now, and hopefully it will come out good. Um, but it's, uh, it's out on uh, Spotify. It's a, it's a Josephine Electric song, and it's got piano and her voice and some synthesizer. So I'll show you. I'll play it now if you're ready. Absolutely. Take it away, Josephine. Still taunting me Still damn You know you're never coming back I still down on the down Still torn down I still Down in the down 
Wow. That's three minutes of Josephine. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much for playing that. Um, I think we need to uh, explain well, a little we're bit probably going to have you on the podcast again, no <laughs> doubt, but I think we need to do um, a virtual uh, performance. <laughs> performance, like just dedicated to um, you sharing your talents. Um, I'm so inspired by your story, Keith. How can our viewers and listeners get in contact with you? Well, I'm on Instagram as Phantom Electric Ghost, just uh, Phantom Electric Ghost, all one word. People can DM me there. Uh, I do interviews myself with emerging artists all over the world. I'm actually collaborating with a Japanese artist right now and an American R&B soul artist on a two projects. Um, but yeah, people can contact me there. I'm on Vampire, which is a, uh, like a Tinder for, for musicians. It's like B-A-M-P-R as Fam Electric Ghost. So people reach me there. Uh, Facebook, Fam Electric Ghost, Instagram. And my website, which is, you know, FamElectricGhost.com. You can actually uh, ping me there. Oh, that's awesome. And of course, I will make sure that all that information is in the show notes. I hope you will definitely consider coming back again. Oh, definitely. You know, it's, it's always fun. Uh, I started, you know, doing some of these. I was on this British podcast a couple of years ago and uh, I had Josephine there. So anytime I can try to get Josephine on it, I try to do it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And thank you to Josephine. Josephine, it was amazing having you on. And, you know, I, I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, I, I really did enjoy it. It was very fun. And oh. uh, I, I like being able to get out from under uh, all this tech stuff sometimes and talk. <laughs> that That is awesome. And we were so excited to have you. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And, you know, for those who want to find out more, obviously, like I said, I will make sure all of his contact information is in the show notes. And we will, of course, um have yeah, an update. I'm on all the streaming services too like I'm on iTunes Apple Spotify Tidal, oh, YouTube perfect. everywhere like anytime you just type in fam but I'm in like two tiered like if you go in you'll find my podcast and then you might think oh he's only a podcaster but then if you also look under artists fam like a ghost is in there as a podcast and as a musician so all of our records on all those streaming platforms uh we're on Amazon we're on YouTube music too Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And wow, this has been so amazing. I've learned so much. Um, and hopefully maybe next time we can do something with my with my musical voice, um, because you would not want to hear me sing right now, because I certainly don't have the talent. So um, th this has been so exciting, it's very informative. You know, everyone, you know, take time to check out his information. He's such a talented um, music person, personality, um, a producer, and really you put your heart into soul and you weren't afraid to do that. And these are the type of stories that inspire us. I was certainly inspired by you. I so enjoyed this conversation. My name is Janice, the host of Stories That Inspire Us. Today, I was truly inspired by this amazing man, Phantom Electric Ghost, a.k.a. Josephine, so many a.k.a.s, the Keith Gittens Jones. Thank you so much, everyone. And remember, if you have a story to share, someone needs to hear it. Go to my website, register as a guest. And let's have that conversation. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks again, Keith. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Me too.